for access to federal programs and, and over-reliance on petroleum and, ex and an existing infrastructure that fails to meet new hazard mitigation codes. The U.S. affiliated small island nation increasingly are being forced to consider what will happen if rising sea wash over the, if rising sea wash over their land specifically will it mean a loss of their sovereignty and resources and having to decide where their people go from there the insular area climate change act of 2021 discussion draft seeks to address these threats by creating an interagency task force to identify ways to provide greater access to climate change related federal programs to 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 us territories establish an office of insular area energy policy and programs within the department of energy to centralize and expand federal energy programs in insular areas and to create multiple grant programs to invest in renewable energy and sustainable infrastructure in the insular areas climate change is real and 97 percent of climate science agree that climate warming trends over the past century are extremely likely likely due to human activities. We must all do our work to, to, to reverse the, this trend, which we aim to do through the work of this committee. The Insular uh, Areas Climate Change Act and the other bills we are seeking to get enacted this year will provide some of the additional tools we will need to begin to address climate change. Thank you. With that, let me now turn to uh, the ranking member for uh, the comments. With the yeah. Ranking rec member is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank you, uh, the witness for being virtually with us today. Specifically, I want to particularly welcome the two witnesses from Puerto Rico, Ms. Adam Monson and Secretary Machargo from the Natural Resources uh, Committee. It's, it's great to see you again. I would also like to commend in part uh, the intent behind the draft legislation we have before us today. It is no secret that territories like other coastal communities across the nation face unique climate changes, uh, such as coastal erosion, as you said, sea level rise and the impact of extreme weather events. Uh, we all recognize the need to tackle these issues, build resilience, and implement mitigation measures. Uh, we also recognize that territories heavily rely on imported petroleum products to meet our energy needs. Uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, petroleum fire power plants generate almost half of the Puerto Rico's total electricity, while renewables only account for 0.5% of our electricity generation. Like many, I am sensitive to how we treat uh, the planet and recognize that we shall increase our use of renewable energy sources. However, I also support an all of the above energy approach. I am a strong proponent of liquefied natural gas, which provides cheap, clean, and reliable energy. Reliable, I think, is crucial uh, for Puerto Rico, especially to support and expand our pharmaceutical and manufacturing uh, industries. The draft legislation we are discussing today authorized approximately $200 million uh, through a series of new grants programs and offices within the Department of Interior, NOAA, the Department of Energy, EPA, while having resources available to the e U.S. insular areas is most welcome. I fear this bill does little to study existing programs and functions that could support some of the goals intended in this legislation. Additionally, I'm concerned about a provision in the bill the definition of insular affairs under Section 1469A of Title 48 of the U.S. Code to include Puerto Rico. This section currently only apply to the other four territories that and authorizes federal agencies to waive applicable matching requirements for them. It also authorized federal agencies to consolidate grants to a particular territory under multiple programs. The individual territory may then uh, det determine the proportion of the consolidated grant to be spent on various activities. I fear that adding Puerto Rico to the definition of insular areas under Title 48 could have unintended consequences of an overhaul how federal grant programs work on the island currently. Puerto Rico is often treated as a state for purposes of multiple federal allocations. I'm concerned that authorizing agencies to consolidate grants 
at least for Puerto Rico, will not only impact how federal programs are carried out, but also the, out, the amount of funding we are eligible for. Additionally, I will note that the bill includes a, a portion of the Offshore Wind Territories Act by partisan legislation I have introduced to study, and uh, if feasible, in authorize offshore wind energy development in federal waters ad adjacent to the territories, which is a bipartisan bill, is not include, however, the bill's revenue sharing and coral reef conservation provisions that our bill includes. It is my hope that we can move forward that bill in its entirely and a standalone this Congress. Uh, finally, I am deeply concerned we will not be hearing today from witnesses uh, from the administration who will be charged with implementing this bill if it's signed into law, like the Department of Interior, EPA, NOAA, among others, including the Department of Energy. I will respectfully ask, Mr. Chairman, that we formally ask the administration or uh, the people who are running those agencies uh, this time uh, for their comments and provide members of the committee a chance to ask them questions, uh, and it remains unclear uh, whether any of these programs or our office functions will be duplicative or redundant. Having said that, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I yield back. Let me, let, let me thank the general lady. I appreciate uh, the commissioner's comments. I thought uh, they're well taken. I think uh, your point about uh, does consolidation mean less for? Uh, does consolidation mean that we're staying at the same cap of money and yet uh, with, with with a larger demand and, and a larger uh, uh, responsibility and requirement? I think that is a very valid point that, that as the legislation moves forward, that certainly needs to be looked at. And as for the administration, I concur with, uh, with your point. Uh, and, and as this legislation is finalized, and uh, and the input from today's hearing and additional discussions with with members uh, uh, continuing in a bipartisan way uh, that we have a a, a a piece of legislation that uh, that the administration needs to comment on because that's the legislation that is projected to move forward uh, certainly that information that their comments their opinions and and their recommendations to the committee will not only be forwarded and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to uh to have those discussions in person and i appreciate those comments with that uh, uh with that let me uh, now uh turn to our witnesses uh where is the witnesses let me get to the witness list let me begin now uh, our, our, our witness list, and I, I want first of all let me uh, let me concur with the uh, ranking member and, and uh, uh, excuse me, um, Mr. Westerman, you wanted to uh, to comment on something. Let me let me recognize you, sir. I didn't I didn't see the I didn't see the signal, but I do now. Mr. Westerman, you recognized? You wanted to uh, comment? If not, let me return to the witnesses. Ms. Ada Monson, member, Puerto Rico Climate Change Committee. Uh, Ms. Monson, uh, five minutes are yours. Uh, the, the, the lights, uh, five minutes is, is the time limit. The, the full uh, complement of your comments are going to be made part of the record regardless. And uh, uh, the floor is yours and the time is yours. Uh, Ms. Masson, you're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to thank you, Mr. Chairman Grijalva, Ranking Member Water Westerman, and our resident commissioner, Jennifer Gonzalez, for the invitation to testify before this committee. It is an honor to share with you today my experience regarding the impact of climate change in the island environment and the need for swift actions to avoid the negative consequences of climate change. I am meteorologist Adam Monson. I have been a forecaster in Puerto Rico for 32 years. 
And during that time, I have forecasted Hurricanes Hugo and George. Most recently, and for the first time in my life, I faced the challenge of keeping Puerto Rico informed during the passage of the island of two Category 5 hurricanes, Irma and Maria. I'm also an educator and a broadcaster. And as an educator, I have dedicated my life to teaching about natural hazards and connecting science with the communities, especially working with nonprofits, schools, industries, emergency management, local, state, and federal government. I'm here representing Puerto Rico, the education community, nonprofits, through the Eco Exploratorio, which hosts the Science Museum of Puerto Rico and the Resilience Institute of Puerto Rico. This conversation is needed because our island are already victims of climate change are in a very vulnerable position compared to other countries in the world. Changes due to climate change are already evident along our coast due to sea level rise and coastal erosion in the temperature and rainfall records, in the impact to our corals and marine ecosystems, in our health system and economic development, and in our response and recovery to catastrophic events. First, we need to understand the science and impact of climate change in our daily lives. Scientists around the world have demonstrated that our global temperatures are rising in an unprecedented manner. Under these conditions, there will be direct and indirect effects on organisms, hydrological cycle, maximum temperature records, decrease in agricultural production activity, changes in habitats and wildlife distribution, risk to human health, such as stroke and cardiovascular diseases, and the quality of life on Earth will significantly decrease. Life as we know today will not end, but will be significantly different. We can talk about science related to climate change, and there is enough data on this. But what we need to do is the right thing in how the committee can help change and influence the future of our islands and country, addressing energy, coastal erosion, the weather warnings, the community needs. As important it is as it is to move to renewable energy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, our islands need to concentrate on the implementation of adaptation and mitigation measures to reduce natural health, social and economic vulnerabilities. Current fiscal and economic challenges of the islands, coupled with an increasingly elderly population, create additional challenges for the island's government to prepare for, respond to, and recover from climate-related disaster. I strongly believe that to transform our communities, we need to understand their needs, and only then can we design and implement programs in ways that community members engage to achieve adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. Climate and extreme weather events suffered in the last five years in Puerto Rico have catalyzed actions that help us advance social transformation in our community, promoting an uprising in community-based organizations that have pursued sustainable development and climate adaptation. These initiatives were centered on the engagement of the communities that were impacted by Hurricane Maria and are still recovering from the aftermath. The question we need to ask ourselves is how to best approach it. I would urge this committee to make sure that public policy serves our communities and that we use all the scientific knowledge to make it useful to the communities. If we have better local emergency management resources, we can respond faster. If we have accessible and prepared healthcare facilities for long period energy outages, we can respond to people that need intensive care, oxygen, insulin, or suffer renal deficiency and cancer. If we have a better data collection of the most vulnerable population, we can respond faster. If we have incentives for renewable energy practices, we will have a less economic impact. If we have better agricultural practices, we will have more food security. If we want to ensure the integrity of ecosystems and the protection of biodiversity, some can probably resist ex external environmental stresses. If we have more empathy and solidarity, we can better understand community needs and make decisions that are community-based, centered on the well-being of the community. Climate change is real. By experience, we know. Thank you for holding this much needed and important hearing. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, let, before I, I, I turn to the ambassador for his comments, let me, uh, I think Mr. Westerman wanted to make a, uh, had a comment or a, a question. And uh, uh, let me, let me, let me uh, make an effort to, uh, 
to recognize him again for his comment. Mr. Westerman, you're recognized. Let me return to the witnesses, uh, Mr. Gerald Sakios, Ambassador to the U.S. Republic of Marshall Islands. Mr. Ambassador, the time is yours, five minutes. Thank you, sir, for being here, much appreciated. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership regarding the special threats that climate change poses to the Marshall Islands, the RMI, and the other insular jurisdictions of or freely associated with the United States. Thank you as well for making it possible for me to complete my testimony in time to meet with President Biden's National Security Advisor at 1 p.m., a time I could not change. Climate change poses an existential threat to the RMI in a way that it doesn't to only three of the world's other nations. Our highest point of land is less than six feet of a sea level, level rise. This is also a threat to the defense and economic security of the United States. Our free association gives the U.S. the right to deny other nations access to a strategic expanse of the Pacific that is nearly 25% of the size of the 48 continental United States. Another nation covets shipping lanes in the waters that the U.S. controls access to now, but won't control if the RMI is submerged. Further, a U.S. Army study found that its Ronald Reagan ballistic missile defense test site on our Kwajalein Atoll, which the Joint Chiefs of Staff call, and I quote, the world's premier range for anti-ballistic missile testing and space operation support, I end quote, will be underwater in three decades. That is, if it's not, this is, unless this is prevented. These are the reasons why it is so important for the committee to prioritize climate change planning, mitigation, adaptation, and resilience in the RMI. It is also why the RMI is applying a climate uh, threat lens to all policies. It is, for example, why the issues required to be considered in use of compact or free association assistance. So we are excited about the draft bill. We also have some, have some suggestions to strengthen it. First, we respectfully re uh, suggest the finding be, amend uh, be amended to recognize that sea level rise is an existential threat to the RMI, and this would undermine U.S. economic and defense security. Second, we respectfully request that all provisions of the bill that address climate change challenges in the U.S. territories apply in the freely associated states as well. Most al already do, but there is some in which, because of language, do not. Third, we request that the bill direct the preparation of a report on the impacts of climate change on the ruined dome nuclear waste storage facility and other hazards, hazards in its vicinity at any way talk at all by independent experts agreed by both of our governments. Such a study would cover major gaps in a June 2020 report by the Department of Energy required by law. It should propose options to remedy all of the contaminants left on any way top, inclu including its lagoon and mitigate related threats due to climate development. The U.S. conducted nuclear testing equal to the force of 1.6 Hiroshima-sized bomb every day for 12 years while it administered our islands as trustee for the UN. The remaining nuclear waste and other contaminants are now threatened by sea level rise. Recent leakage from the dome has generated concern from Hawaii and the UN Secretary General while he was in Fiji. Uh, fourth, we advise adding the Defense Department to the bill's insular, insular interagency task force. The RMI would also benefit from technical support from the Interior's Department's Fish and Wildlife Services and the Commerce Department's National Marine Fisheries Service on the Lulu office. Finally, we would like to discuss with the committee staff how some specific projects can be funded. One is for solar power systems for islands of Wache, Jalut, Rangrang, and Santo, and to fully transition e by Kwajalein and other atolls to renewable energy. Another would improve sea level rise data defining the actual risk for each of our communities. We also need assistance for our Raymanla pro uh, process, which uh, guides our planning in sea level rise. 
and we propose an Atoll Research Center of Excellence at the College of Marshall Islands to consolidate research not only for the RMI, but for all insular areas. Thank you for your attention and again for your leadership. I would be pleased to answer any questions and look forward to working with the committee on this resolution. The RMI is fortunate that the committee remembers that the RMI is a member of the U.S. extended political family, inextricably, but voluntarily linked link for an unlimited uh, future. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your comments. And uh, let me now uh, turn to Mr. Jean-Pierre Oriol, Commissioner of USVI Department of Planning and Natural Resources. And uh, sir, uh, the time is yours. Thank you. And, and beginning, I'd like to start off by saying I bid you talofa, buenos dias, um, half a day, and good afternoon by all the insular area family, Representative Grijalva. Thank you for the opportunities to testify in support of the proposed Insular Areas Climate Change Act on behalf of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Whether it is the 2015 federally declared disaster for drought in the U.S. Caribbean, the impact of Hurricanes Irma and Maria on Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands in 2017, a tropical cyclone Gita in American Samoa, or Super Typhoon U2 in the Mariana Islands in 2018. The people of the Virgin Islands and the insular areas and territories of the United States are no strangers to damaging events associated with climate change. Our islands make minimal, in, uh, minimal contributions to greenhouse gas emissions, yet they are experiencing overwhelming ecological, economic, and cultural impacts from global climate change, which will dramatically increase over the next several decades. The combined effects of sea level rise, ocean acidification, increased storm intensity and frequency, and significant changes in rainfall, coral bleaching, and temperature-induced changes in the distribution of ocean productivity and fisheries are of great concern to all of the insular areas and require addressing infrastructure improvements as well as sustainability and climate change adaptation planning. Addressing climate change in an effective and timely manner is one of the most pressing challenges where sound environmental policy is also at the best is also the best economic policy and addresses key quality of life issues for present and future generations. For the U.S. Virgin Islands, as we recover from the devastation suffered from two Category 5 hurricanes, we are focused on incorporating long-term resilience into our everyday way of life. The U.S. Virgin Islands is involved in several initiatives related to assessing the impacts from climate change in our territory. In conjunction with the University of the Virgin Islands and using funding from NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, the VI's Coastal Zone Management Program is developing a coastal vulnerability index that will identify our susceptibility to different climate-related events such as sea level rise, tsunamis, storm surge, drought, coastal flooding, and coastal erosion. The Department of Interior's Office of Insular Affairs has provided funding to the territory through its coral reef initiative to install ocean acidification monitors at our long-term monitoring sites and has also provided funding to the territory for a 50 kilowatt microgrid at one of our hurricane shelter sites. The U.S. Department of Energy is partnering on many initiatives with the Virgin Islands Division of Energy including an energy rebate program, our sun power grant program, and providing technical assistance with our comprehensive energy strategy. The government of the Virgin Islands is receiving support from FEMA's mid hazard mitigation program for the updating of our hazard mitigation resilience plan, which identifies threats across all sectors and strategies to be implemented as part of our long-term resilience. And lastly, but not exhaustive, I would also like to recognize the support given to us by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, who is administering the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Funding to the U.S. Virgin Islands, which has a mandate that the U.S. Virgin Islands to relate the activities in the third tranche of funds to the Hazard Mitigation Resilience Plan. The proposed bill provides five sections directing the actions of our federal partners in assisting the insular areas and territories with planning and implementation of climate resilience activities. The U.S. Virgin Islands is supportive of all the directives in Titles 2 through 6, and overall, the Virgin Islands sees the significance of this bill as the proposed creation of programs and steady funding sources specifically for the insular areas and territories to address impacts related to climate change. 
We applaud the bill sponsor for the language included in Title I, Section 101C1 and C2 related to the equitable baseline funding. Many baseline formulas for assistance under federal programs use landmass or population. What's the audio on that? Is that me or just the, the system? I believe he has, he has, the connectivity issues. Right. Please. Okay. John Pierre, again. As the as the FAS is eligible. Mr. Oriel, are, are, are you available? Is the system on? Mr. Chair, this is Nancy. I believe he's having connectivity issues. Okay, we'll, um, uh, as soon as, as as soon as the clerk, uh, we we can return to finish that part of the of the testimony. Uh, let me now. Uh, we'll move to uh, Secretary uh, Machargo Maldonado, uh, Secretary of Planning and Natural Resources, Puerto Rico, uh, for his comments, and then we'll return. And we can tell Mr. Oriol that we'll return to him for him to finish his comments as soon as. Uh, the technical issues are dealt with. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the time is yours, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Grijalva, Westerman, President Commissioner Gonzalez, and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the draft of the Insular Area Climate Change Act. My name is Rafael Machargo. I am the Secretary of the Department of Natural and Environmental Resources of Puerto Rico. Also, I am the Chairman of the Puerto Rico Climate Change Expert and Advisory Committee. Created under Puerto Rico Act Number 33 of, 19, of 2019, the committee's prima, primary duty is to advise on the implementation of Puerto Rico public policy on climate change and prepare the plan for the mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency of the climate change in Puerto Rico. The committee is the official government organization for all climate change matters in Puerto Rico. The community which I am honored to share comprises of nine members, three of them ex officio and six scientists and academic uh, members uh, and experts appointed by the governor and confirmed by the, the legislature. Uh, the permanent members are as following. Engineer Caracter Soderberg, former director of the Caribbean Division of the Environmental Protection Agency. He's our water expert. Meteorologist Adam Monson. Uh, she already testified, she's our uh, meteorologist. Climatologist Rafael eh, Mendez Tejeda. He's uh, also the dean of the University of Puerto Rico, Carolina Campus. Global Renewable Energy Expert, Mr. Roy Charles Tolbert. He is the director of the Rock and Mountain Institute. Uh -huh. And the expert on, in climate change and public health, Dr. Pablo Mendez Lazaro. 
He works at the University of Puerto Rico Medical Science Department. And finally, coastal oceanographer, Dr. Maritza Barreto. She is the chair of Coastal Research and Planning Institute of Puerto Rico and the government's uh, and member of the American Shore and Beach Association Board of Directors. The government's representatives are the, the Secretary of Economic Development and Commerce, the President of the University of Puerto Rico, and the Secretary of National Environmental Resources. In the past few years, Puerto Rico has experienced the effects of severe weather. On September 20, 1970, Hurricane Maria, a powerful hurricane with sustained winds of over 150 miles per hour, made the direct landfall and bisected the entire island of Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria caused widespread destruction and left flooded associated with over 40 inches of rainfall. Major devastation residential areas, roads, bridges, communication towers, and total failure of the electric grid. Infrastructure caused by the collapse of thousands of power lines and poles. Furthermore, the storm activated thousands of landslides, registered in high altitude and steep slope topographic areas, including the Central Range or La Cordillera Central region. NOAA's a, a National Center for Environmental Information and the National Hurricane Center jointly classified Hurricane Maria as the United States' third costiest tropical cyclone. Damage in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands totaled over $19 billion. Climate change needs to be addressed urgently. For that matter, we strongly support Chairman Grijalva proposed intention to move forward with the climate change issues in the U.S. territories and freely associated states. Although the Committee of Climate Change of Puerto Rico will be submitting more specific comments on the newest draft version of the bill or main recommendations are as follows. Title three, we recommend to appropriate the funds to acquire a regional next rat Doppler system. Given the catastrophic nature of tropical cyclones, resulting from climate change. And an additional next round Doppler system must be incorporated into the island's regime. Also, we, we recommend the, the revaluation of the allocation of the amounts to be appropriated by Congress for the different programs. We would recommend to add a section, a, a, a section on Title V to include the following. Technical assistance. The Environmental Protection Agency will provide technical assistance to territories and free associated states on adaptation and resilience to climate change impacts on water supply. The technical assistance will include but will not be limited to implementation of EPA's Water Sense Water Conservation Program, water, uh, wastewater reuse, rainfall harvesting, and reduction of, port of potable water loss in the distribution system, protection of aquifer research areas, erosions, control, and among others. We also recommend, recommend in Title III, Section 302, the, uh, uh, to, re, to include technical assistance on coastal erosion and flooding. And also we recommend add a, a new section for mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency climate change plan. A. One year after the enactment of this law, each territory shall submit a climate change mitigation adaptation and resiliency plan. B, grants. FEMA will provide each territory up to $1 million to develop a comprehensive climate change mitigation adaptation and resiliency plan. The plan will be submitted to the Federal Task Force for approval. Once approved, each territory will implement it according to the timetables included in the document. Federal grants to implement mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency projects will be contingent on the approved plans. Once again, we want to, uh, to thank the Honorable Commission for the opportunity to present these preliminary comments and recommendations on the proposed bill, as further commentaries will be submitted in the proper time. The Committee on Climate Change hopes to 
you to find this useful and reiterate its commitment to supporting the initiatives to address climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Now let me ask uh, uh, Ms. Zina Grenick, Grechny, uh, Sustained Climate Assessment Specialist, East West Center. Uh, the time is yours. Thank you very much for being here. Look forward to your testimony. Aloha and good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman and distinguished committee members for this opportunity to, to testify. My name is Zina Grechny and I'm the Sustained Climate Assessment Specialist at the East West Center in Honolulu. I have worked for more than a decade in Hawaii and the U.S. Affiliated Pacific Islands, or USAPI. Uh, this is the region that includes American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, and the Freely Associated States. I coordinate the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment, or PERCA, our regional assessment effort, and serve as an author on its recent reports, as well as on the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Climate change has arrived in the Pacific Islands. Governments and leaders are taking the impact seriously and are committing resources, time, and creativity to keep people safe while fostering adaptation and practical planning for the future. Yet climate change remains the greatest challenge to our region. Without increased support, adaptation will not approach the scale needed to meet multiple crises that climate change will bring to the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands, um, home to nearly half a million people. I am therefore pleased and excited by the introduction of the Insular Area Climate Change Act, which will leverage the considerable efforts of Pacific Island governments and communities and further build local adaptive capacity. The act will help address unique risks to our region. In 2018, we saw Super Typhoon to damage and destroy a significant portion of buildings and infrastructure in the Northern Mariana Islands, requiring more than $100 million in public assistance. Scientists have recorded an increase on average in the tropical cyclone intensity globally, and they expect further increases in the strength of hurricanes and typhoons as the climate warms, amplifying the potential for severe damage. Even small increases in average sea level could be disastrous for Pacific Islands, where the majority of infrastructure and communities lie along the coast near sea level. And as um, Ambassador Zakios referenced, it's an existential threat for the Marshall Islands and other low-lying atolls. Sea level rise is expected to accelerate strongly after mid-century, highlighting the need for adaptive action now to avoid higher long-term costs. Wildfire, drought, hotter weather, and more extreme rainfall events threaten public health and the provision of critical services like safe drinking water. Compound impacts could cause severe disruptions to livelihoods and could compel migration. So what approaches are needed to address these unique risks? Well, some of the most cost-effective climate solutions involve boosting the resilience of local ecosystems. Coral reefs inject hundreds of millions of dollars into local economies each year and offer vital protection from coastal flooding. In Guam, Reef-related tourism alone adds $323 million per year annually. Severe coral bleaching is now more frequent and is expected to happen annually before 2050 if current warming continues. Programs and grants under this act would therefore catalyze and scale up uh, vital coral reef conservation and restoration programs. Basing management decisions on past experience alone is kind of like trying to drive by looking in the mirror. More data is needed to see the upcoming curves in the road. This act would expand climate monitoring to existing NOAA programs, helping to guarantee that we have fine scaled projections for a region that currently lacks them. Ultimately, the data must reach managers who can apply it, and my team supports that kind of work. I am part of the Pacific RISA, one of uh, 11 regional integrated science and assessments programs that uh, the NOAA Climate Program Office funds to help managers produce actionable research and help them to evaluate and identify adaptation actions. The proposed Insular Area Climate Change Task Force would point to ways to provide more equitable access to territories and the associated states to federal climate change programs. I would suggest that a task force include heads of state, 
govern governors and presidents as members or advisors to better guarantee the success of new and existing programs. Other potential blind spots in the curve are shifts in global energy supply and prices. The US affiliated Pacific Islands, again, here are very vulnerable as they are dependent on imported fossil fuels and electricity prices for residents are higher than the US average. Titles four and five of the act would inject um, critical funds to US territories and freely associated states to access renewable sources of reliable renewable energy and increase their resilience to extreme weather and price shocks. Because Pacific Islands have constrained financial, technical, and human capacity, the Act rightly puts emphasis on programmatic coordination and technical assistance. Local training and capacity building are essential. The Pacific RISA stands ready to support important new programs for the US insular areas to address climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, testimony. Let me now ask uh, Dr. Austin Shelton, Director, University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability, for your comments. Doctor, the floor is yours. Chairman Grijalva, Ranking Member Westerman, and distinguished members of the committee. Hafade, my name is Austin Shelton, and I am a marine and environmental scientist serving as the director of the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability and Guam Sea Grant, and also co-chair of the U.S. Climate Strong Islands Network. Instead of heavy climate statistics and data, which I'm sure my fellow witnesses and I are submitting to you all in writing, I would like to start off with some counterintuitive thoughts about islands. Under the weight of climate change impacts, biodiversity loss, debilitating storms and swallowing seas, islands are not sinking. Strong and resilient, islands are rising. Traditional celestial navigators remind the world that islands were never isolated. Oceans connected us for millennia. Now a vast network of undersea fiber optic cables make islands some of the most digitally connected places in the world. While the pandemic dictates that we plant our feet one place on the ground, we connect across the planet here on screens to share glimpses of what a brighter future could look like. Islands are rising. Since the start of non-indigenous colonial periods, islands suffered high rates of chronic conditions and communicable diseases. Now, during the most challenging global health pandemic, islands are among the safest places in the world. Islands are rising. I would like to thank Chairman Grijalva for introducing this legislation and thank the members for considering the critical support it would provide for climate change planning, mitigation, and adaptation in U.S. island territories and freely associated states. The University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability was established in 2009 to lead and support the transition of our island region toward a sustainable future, and our center fully supports the legislation and is pleased to offer comments. Echoing my fellow witnesses, climate change impacts to our nation are disproportionate. Islands contribute the least to the causes of climate change, yet we experience the brunt of its impacts in the form of frequent and severe storm events, droughts, flooding, and coral bleaching. Islands are victims and we're suffering, but we also have lots of knowledge and innovations to share as bright spots for the nation in the fight against climate change. That is why I say to you that islands are rising. It's the theme of our upcoming University of Guam Conference on Island Sustainability, which last year brought together thousands of islanders from around the globe virtually. And one island innovation example that we learned through the conference network last year was solar schools in Puerto Rico. Following hurricanes Irma and Maria, over 100 schools were equipped with solar PV and battery storage. The project can serve as a roadmap to resilience for other island communities that we would love to follow in Guam with the resources to be provided through this legislation. After disasters, schools become community shelters and command centers. Right now, schools are COVID-19 testing, vaccination, and food distribution sites. Upgrading school infrastructure with solar photovoltaics and battery storage will greatly improve resilience as electricity is often wiped out for weeks or months following a disaster. Guam recently took a few big steps toward achieving a sustainable future, and we would be ready to take advantage of new opportunities provided through this legislation. In November 2019, Guam Public Law 35-46 was signed, mandating 
50% renewable energy production for the island by 2035 and 100% by 2045. In September 2020, the Guam Green Growth Action Framework was formally adopted by the Governor of Guam, Lourdes Leon Guerrero. The initiative aligns with the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, serving as our island's most comprehensive action plan ever created to achieve a sustainable future. UN Sustainable Development Goal 13, action, uh, climate action, is a common thread through the whole framework. A Guam Coral Reef Resilience Strategy and Guam Climate Change Resilience Commission were also recently formed. And thanks to the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment and Xena's presentation, we know what climate impacts are here and on the way. With our island's initiatives in place and priorities identified, Guam is ready to hit the ground running with technical assistance and infrastructure development upon passage of this legislation. The University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability implements climate actions and serves as a convener of local, regional, and global partners. In solidarities, islands are uniting in common purpose through the local 2030 Islands Network, Climate Strong Islands Network, and other organizations to act on climate. Islands are distant, but they are not alone. Together, islands are rising. Sujus so Maasi, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Doctor. Let me return to uh, Commissioner Oriel from U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Planning and Resources. If the technical difficulties have been uh, dealt with, and uh, to finish his his testimony, that uh, he, he was unable to do so at that time. Thank you, Chairman Griava, and, and thank you for allowing me to to navigate through these small island issues that we have down here. Uh, I'll just return to page four of my testimony. Um, and so the the U.S. Virgin Islands is very supportive of the coral reef prize competition authorized under Title I, Section 103 of the bill. As the Caribbean islands are faced with battling the effects of the stony coral tissue loss disease, and the Pacific islands are increasing efforts for restoration in response to the 50% loss of coral in the last six years due to bleaching, awarding funds supporting innovative in ideas for research and conservation in the insular areas will provide a great benefit for the management of coral reef ecosystems. The USVI would ask that the language also include restoration in addition to research and conservation as we work with partners in more active management for coastal coral reef ecosystems that protect our coasts and service the community with our food, economy, and quality of life. Coastal water quality is both human health and natural resource management issue that will be significantly impacted by climate change. Climate will impact available drinking water and pose increased risk from stormwater discharge. Funding should be earmarked to upgrade the infrastructure to ensure adequate drinking water supply and effectively manage the volume and quality of ocean discharge from stormwater to protect coral reef, coastal coral reef ecosystems. Under Title IV, Section 405, as it relates to the opportunities for the development of offshore wind, the USVI would ask that consideration for the language to include wave energy production be included. The monitoring buoys to include those that are part of the integrated ocean observing system suggests that there is great potential for wave energy generations in the U.S. Virgin Islands. This, this potential may exist beyond the territorial limits of the USVI in the U.S. EEZ, and as such, we would not want to limit the potential for research and investment only to wind production. As it relates to Title V, Section 503 for the development of an insular area sustainable infrastructure grant program, again, we highlight the significant amount of funding associated with this program, which would allow the islands to make significant improvements to the infrastructure systems. We would ask that language also be considered such that each insular area receive assistance from FEMA to standardize the hazard mitigation package that will be used to respond and to restore coastal natural resource loss after future natural disasters to maintain coastal protection, rather than such loss being on a case-by-case -case basis. Lastly, on behalf of the Insular family, I would like to thank the bill sponsor for language in Title I, Section 102A, proposing increasing the cost share match waiver from 200,000 to 750,000, as well as the many sections calling for the waiving of the match requirement for the different programs. This would not only impact our programs covered under this bill, but across many of our territorial programs 
altogether. In conclusion, I would like to thank you, Mr. Chair, and the members of the committee for the opportunity to address the proposed Insular Areas Climate Change Act. There are many benefits to the people of the insular areas and territories that can be realized from the passage of this bill. This comprehensive strategy to address climate impacts to the islands will result not only in improvement of our natural and built systems, but will also improve our economic, social, and cultural systems as well, providing a sound legacy for future generations. We look forward to Congress's favorable consideration of this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm uh, very glad that you, we were able to finish that part of your testimony. Yep. Uh, appreciate it very much. Let me, uh, uh, now uh, it's time to uh, the, the members to ask uh, questions, comments to our witnesses. And uh, again, the five minute limit being in place for the members. And let me uh, recognize myself for the initial question. Uh, Chair, Chairman Grahava. This is, this is Representative Westerman. Um, Mr. Ranking Member, uh, I was trying to uh, acknowledge you a, a couple of previous times now that I have you there. Uh, you recognize me. Uh, thank you. I could hear you, but apparently uh, there was a problem getting my microphone unmuted, but uh, it's working now. Thank you, Chairman. I just <clears throat> wanted to make some, some opening comments and want to thank the witnesses uh, for being with us virtually today as well as, as all the members. Uh, as you are all aware, the United States territories and freely associated states are located in some of the most remote places on the planet. Aside from environmental and climate concerns, there are legacy issues with many of the insular energy systems, as has been highlighted by uh, recent tropical storms. Each have individual needs and circumstances that should be given thoughtful consideration when Congress does its work. Although when creating long-term energy plans, we should consider all energy sources and technologies, but we also must be intellectually realistic, knowing that the, the greenhouse gas emissions from insular areas is hardly a blip in the global data. A healthy economy and a healthy environment are linked. Reliable, efficient, and affordable energy are critical to both the economy and the environment. Domestic production of both conventional and alternative energy sources ensures that the best global standards will be used to power our nation and our allies abroad. As the U.S. has some of the most stringent environmental and labor standards in the world. Even assuming renewable energy continues its recent growth trajectory, global demand for oil and natural gas is not expected to fade in the foreseeable future. In fact, the Energy Information Administration predicts a 40% growth in global natural gas consumption by 2050. Energy policy for insular areas must focus not only on renewability, but also on reliability, efficiency, and affordability. The important question today is what are the practical ways we can reduce pollution, promote a healthier environment, and not decimate the American taxpayers and families' checkbooks, nor the economies and standard of living in insular areas. Although this is our first hearing this Congress, this committee has held numerous climate change hearings in each of its subcommittees the past several years. <clears throat> Most seem to be more about playing politics and the generation of headlines instead of workable solutions. What is clear is that a total energy transition by 2030 is estimated to eliminate nearly all of the current energy sources and the millions of jobs related to those sources. It is also clear that this would have an extraordinary cost. The draft bill by Mr. Grijalva authorizes millions of dollars for new grant programs and offices to push the insular areas towards the use of renewables and mitigate effects of climate change. While the intent of doing something positive for the insular areas is commendable, I believe this bill somewhat misses the mark in some key areas. In my mind, there's nothing limiting the executive branch from forming a task force on its own to study access barriers the insular areas face and issue a report to Congress. It is vitally important to work with each of these islands leaders and their members in Congress to address each island's specific goals and needs. 
strengthening existing programs and grants available should come before we see an expansion of government. Congress should be providing tools to the insular areas and allowing each of them to make their own decisions on what energy sources they use or want to develop. I am also concerned that we don't have any witnesses here today from the administration. These officials will be able to speak to the capacity of existing programs and if increases are warranted. They would also be able to tell whether any of these new grant programs are redundant. I hope today's conversation will help promote sensible solutions that will push for greater coordination between federal agencies that provide assistance to the insular areas and freely associated states. Chairman, I appreciate you uh, coming back to me with the uh, uh, technical problems that we had, and I look forward to uh, the discussion with the witnesses today, and I yield back. No problem, Mr. Ranking Member. Thank you for your comments. And let me, I know the ambassador needs to leave for his uh, very important one o'clock meeting. Uh, and, and if, I, if, if I may, one quick, one quick question. Uh, you state that climate change poses an existential threat to your, to your country. And, it, and you don't use these, th those words lightly because the very existence of your island is challenged, quote unquote. You say that the adaptation is central to your continued ability to exercise your national right of self-determination in the face of challenges faced by, uh, created and faced by climate change. Given the leadership role RMI has been playing on the international stage, particularly around the security issues that you mentioned, uh, I, to highlight the issues you face as a result of climate change that you've done, what lessons can you share that can be helpful in our app efforts to adapt to a new reality. Uh, the, and with that, Mr. Ambassador, let me uh, ask you for whatever response you might have, sir. And I know that you leave after your answer, but I appreciate your time and uh, making time for us today, sir. Uh, thank, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for that uh, very important question. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the Marshall Islands, uh, as you have correctly said, has, 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 uh, has uh, not only um, raised these issues at the regional and global levels uh, on the existential threat that climate change does, but uh, the Marshall Islands has also worked with uh, multilateral institutions to address the issue of climate change. As I mentioned in my oral testimony and in the written testimony, the Marshall Islands is part of a four atolls uh, work that is looking into elevation of islands uh, in the, um, the, the four atolls that are mostly at risk. That is the Marshall Islands, uh, 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 Seychelles, uh, Maldives, uh, and, and uh, Kiribati. Uh, so we, we are working very closely in that effort. We've also looked at, uh, given uh, studies uh, from the University of Hawaii and others, uh, at looking at uh, elevation of islands uh, so that uh, our populations uh, uh, can, re can relocate because of the threats that climate change poses. We have done an energy uh, a national strategy. Uh, we were the first to uh, provide our national uh, determined contribution. So we're looking at renewable energy uh, you know, independence in 2050, full independence in 2020. Uh, so, and these are some of the measures uh, that we have. We continue to advocate uh, uh, that the importance of climate change and as, and as that affects us in the case of the Marshall Islands. We, we see uh, uh, inundations uh, almost every year and at, at every cycle of, of the moon. So it's a real threat to us and, uh, and all these efforts are being taken. And, um, and given that, uh, we have a, a very important uh, uh, and key infrastructure for the U.S. Uh, in, in the Marshall Islands, uh, as stated, the Ronald Reagan Ballistic Missile Defense Site. Island elevation is, is something that is very important. There was a study by George Washington University on elevating islands in the Marshall Islands, as well as in the Hawaii. And these are some efforts that we're, we're uh, continuing to work on. Uh, and we are partners and have uh, entered into and established uh, organizations, including uh, uh, organizations to, to discuss and, and raise more awareness on the issue of climate change. Uh, so these are uh, and some uh, brief comments, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I hope I have been able to answer your question, but if there is need, we could always submit uh, further in writing uh, to, to your committee. Thank you. 
If I may, Mr. Ambassador, one of the questions that, that I think in, invariably comes up is that, you know, do we really need to go this far in terms of uh, the approach uh, uh, with not only this legislation, but other initiatives around climate change? And I think, I, I, I think you, bring, you bring a valid and unique uh, issue, and I think that the Defense Department will be studying that as well now that they're, going, they're free to do that, is the effect uh, national security and defense in, ten, in terms of the assets and the investment that has already occurred uh, short term and long term. And if any follow up with regard to those two topics, national security and defense, and the importance of uh, mitigating uh, the issue of climate change uh, with regard to uh, Marshall Islands in particular in this question, but I think overall, if, if, if you could forward that to the committee, because uh, I think we lose sight of what that is going to cost, both in terms of security, but also in terms of investment that's already occurred in, in, in those locations. Uh, with that, let me thank you. And uh, I'll save other questions for uh, later on and uh, now turn to, uh, uh, to the uh, to ranking member uh, Gonzalez Colon for uh, commissioner for any questions that you might have of our panelists. Thank Listen. you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll go uh, first with Secretary Machargo uh, from Puerto Rico. I know uh, in his statement, uh, he, he made a quite a uh, description of a committee of, of climate, uh, climate expert uh, uh, advisory committee, and he discussed whose members were there. Um, and I would like to know specifically what are uh, the initiatives of that committee uh, for the near future? Um, what What is the resiliency uh, to climate change on the island? Uh, what are the top three specific goals of that committee? Yes. Uh... First, we want uh, to hold uh, community halls to get uh, the, the input from the people on what measures of uh, we should take uh, to tackle climate change and what the ill effects of climate change in these communities. With that, that input from the communities, then the, the community will be in play, reducting a climate change and resiliency plan. Uh, then again, will be submitted for public hearings. The, the plan has some uh, very stringent goals regarding the use of renewable sources for Puerto Rico. One of the uh, mandates of the law that we are implementing right now is uh, to work with the General Services Administration from the government of Puerto Rico to make sure that all vehicle, vehicle purchases by the government of Puerto Rico are either hybrid or electric cars. We are also working uh, with uh, the Energy uh, Regulatory Commission to make sure that the Puerto Rico Electric Energy Authority is moving to, to renewable uh, fuels for the power grid of Puerto Rico. Uh, we are also having, uh, we're going to start a baseline uh, uh, greenhouse gas study. And our next step is also to have an economic study of uh, the economic impacts of not, not having any climate uh, change uh, uh, mitigation measures in the Puerto Rico, what would be those effects in the economy? What, what is this, the most critical climate change uh, related concern in Puerto Rico at this time? Okay, uh, I think it is the coastal erosion. Coastal erosion, and, and we uh, accomplish uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers study uh, for the island uh, during 2017 and 2018 that's still uh, being conducted. One of the uh, issues that you discussed in your in your uh, statement uh, was that Puerto Rico was eligible for a series of grants, um, including NOAA coastal uh, zone management grants and coral reef 
conservation programs, among others. And, and the natural uh, uh, resources uh, department that you actually uh, direct, we see funding in many of those uh, programs. Uh, how has been your experience dealing uh, at this time with NOAA, uh, with Fish and Wildlife, with the Department of Interior, and EPA, uh, regarding all those grants, and how you compare that with FEMA? Okay, we have an excellent relationship with NOAA, Fish and Wildlife, EPA, uh, when getting uh, federal grants and working with them uh, to to achieve the goals of the department. Uh, with, with FEMA, uh, we are, uh, they take too long. Uh, there are still uh, many facilities of the department that have suffered damage from Hurricane Irma and Maria that has not been inspected by FEMA. So we cannot uh, put them in working order and the people are concerned uh, why those, do those facilities are not yet uh, ready to serve the people, and it's yet that uh, we are still working for, for FEMA. Uh, we, we are frustrated by by that. Uh, so, so, so we so we can say that uh, in your experience living with the agency, uh, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife, Department of Interior, EPA, uh, are being dealing with the department uh, very diligent, diligently uh, to work with climate issues. Uh, and you, you've been having good experience with them. Yes, yes, yes. The, the I, only, I know, yes. Uh, I know my, my, my time has expired. Uh, so, so I thank you and I yield back, Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to. Uh, Proceed with the members by uh, seniority. Let me let me uh, uh, now turn to uh, Vice Chair uh, for Insular Affairs uh, for the full committee, uh, Mr. Sablan. Uh, the time is yours, sir. You're recognized. Yeah, thank you, and and welcome to all the witnesses. Uh, thank you for taking the time to submit testimony and for appearing today. Um. Miss Gregney, is that, can I, did I say that right? Miss Gregney? Zena, is that right? I'll call you, can I say, call you Zena? Yeah, you. Hello? Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Having a little bit of a connectivity issue, sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, and, and one of the reasons I asked the committee to include you as a witness is one with, you know, I was impressed with your report on uh, your um, institution's report on climate change in the Northern Mariana Islands. And also because you're able to make comparisons between Northern Marianas, Guam and American Samoa, and of course the uh, freely associated states. Uh, and you alluded in this, um, in your testimony, in your written testimony about the uh, how updates are needed to the energy action plans to account for more recent technological advances, the landscape of, right, and all of those things. So, and I will ask you this because I know it is important to all the witnesses and to all of the residents of the insular areas that lowering the cost of electricity has been a long standing goal for all the insular areas, especially if greenhouse gas emissions can also be decreased. We have been successful in increasing funding for energy action plans mandated in section nine of public law 113, that's 235. And the law requires the Department of Interior to create a team of technical policy and financial experts to write an energy plan for each insular area and to help put the plans in action. The goal is to reduce reliance on expensive imported fuel, replacing it with low energy sources and to improve the efficiency of island power systems. The plans are to include a specific timetable and lay out how the changes can be financed. And every year, Interior is supposed to report to Congress on whether progress is occurring. And every year, um, um, uh, members of representatives of the insular areas fight to make sure that this program is funded. So except for initial technical energy assessments about 10 years ago and the awarding of 
small annual grants that some in interior put out as if they come from their family estate. Uh, none of this requirement established by law is happening. None, zero. And um, there are no proposals, timelines, uh, funding strategies to improve energy efficiency. There has been no substantial progress to move towards reliable source of renewable energy uh, while increasing the resilience of energy infrastructure to extreme weather hazard. So let me ask you, and any of the witness could, could also chime in if they wish, will transferring this requirement that's now assigned to Interior, transferring it to the Department of Energy as this bill proposes, would it help insular areas improve energy efficiencies and reduce costs? What do you think the insular areas need to meet renewable energy targets and protect island communities? And Ms. Gregney, I will tell you, I appreciate your testimony. It's very well written and your report which is science and research based. So anybody has an answer on Ms. Gregney you can start. We have a minute left. Thank you, Vice Chair Sablan. Um, it's really wonderful to hear that the products that we put out uh, from the scientific community can be useful in practical decision making. Um, I would just point out that fossil fuels uh, make up almost 100% of energy budgets for all of the US affiliated Pacific Islands, and um, those must be shipped in. So that's not cost effective or efficient. Um, and so I think that there is a strong need for these energy action plans to really remain coordinated. Um, you know, my experience is not largely in energy, it's in, in, in science and research um, and supporting decision-making, but in that area, I see that, you know, a lot of times we're working under unfunded initiatives. So people are from the management sector and research sector are having to volunteer their time, they're having to um, put aside, you know, the day-to-day -day work and, and really focus on data um, and assembling and synthesizing research to even understand the impacts of climate change. And so, if that is also the case in the energy sector, I can see that um, just having an influx of program, programmatic support would be very helpful. My, um, my time is up, but if anybody else would like to answer that question in writing, I really appreciate that very much. So you support towards Chairman Grijalva's uh, draft of this bill that he's proposing and remove that authority and responsibility from interior into the Department of Energy. I am Chairman, my time is up by you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. And let me now uh, turn to the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Westerman, for his, uh, his time. Sir, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva, and thank you again to the witnesses for your time today. And, you know, as we look at uh, insular areas and energy systems, uh, this is definitely an area that needs to be addressed and uh, I hope we can work as a committee to address those areas, but I think we have maybe a difference of opinion on the best way uh, to address uh, these issues. Uh, Mr. Sablon talked about uh, reliability and, and how important that is and I think most people who connect uh, to their energy systems are, are very concerned about the reliability and the affordability of those energy systems. Uh, Title IV of this bill uh, creates the Renewable Energy Grant Program under DOE, and it specifically says in there uh, that the, uh, the insular areas are freely to choose, uh, or it doesn't give them the freedom to choose what kind of energy sources they use. It specifically uh, refers to renewable energy and says that it can't be uh, generated from fossil fuels or nuclear energy, which I've always thought uh, nuclear was one of the, the cleanest, most reliable sources of energy uh, that we have. So my first question is for Mr. Uh, Machargo, and it is, would you like more flexibility in the language to allow RICO to use these funds towards other sources? Yes, uh, we would like to have more flexibility. We are moving towards uh, having a greater percentage of renewable energies, but uh, the electricity regeneration in Puerto Rico needs to have some reliable base uh, load so the power can stay on when the renewables are not ready. So I would agree with that, uh, that recommendation. And as you know, in the, in the U.S., we've been able to 
cut back on emissions. We've actually decreased emissions more than the, the top 12 countries in the Paris Climate Accord combined uh, without threatening the reliability, actually by using more natural gas. And again, thinking about Puerto Rico and the, the location to the Gulf and where a lot of our uh, liquid natural gas exports would be originating from, uh, would you support being able to use this funding to uh, access LNG uh, to use in Puerto Rico? Well, we will support it if it's within the goals of the of Act 33 of the percentages of uh, renewables versus the percentages of hydrocarbons. Yes, but uh, the remaining percentage of hydrocarbon that the law, law allows, it, it, it should, if, if uh, we're going to use hydrocarbon, it should be renewable uh, natural gas. And uh, Mr. Oriel, do you believe that insular areas should have a say in what energy uh, projects they should be able to use this money for and that the money should not be limited? Um, thank you for the question, uh, Representative. I, I believe that our systems as existing are um, already primarily on fossil fuels. And so I, I think that the limitation to want to push renewables and, and possibly hybridize our systems is actually a better solution for the island destinations. And so while we already have existing systems that will work on our fossils, we're trying to upgrade that infrastructure to be that cleaner uh, burning capacity of multiple types, because I don't think that in, in areas where we have limited land capacity that we can rely on one single so source uh, across our territory. Yeah, I think we've, we've seen that illustrated in a lot of places where we need multiple sources of energy to have that reliability. And also uh, affordability is something that I think it's very important and I'm just wondering how much economics are actually considered uh, or would be considered in these projects and how much of a burden it would create um, on people uh, on the islands to get their electricity uh, so that it would only would not only be reliable but also would be affordable you know one area of renewable energy that that I'm a proponent of is using uh, woody biomass which also, when we look at uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and their proximity to the, to the mainland, uh, you could be a, a huge market for domestically produced wood pellets. Uh, but I'm guessing my, uh, although it's not called out uh, in, the, in the language, I'm guessing uh, woody biomass will be frowned upon uh, as an energy source as well. So I would open that up to any, anyone on the panel about your, uh, your thoughts on using woody biomass as a fuel source. The time is up on those questions uh, and, and uh, uh, we'll adjust and see if there's any, any response uh, going forward. Let me now turn to the chair of the subcommittee on energy, um, Mr. Lowenthal for his questions. Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank all the witnesses for being here. Uh, I'm enjoying this tremendously and being educated myself, as we all know, and the reason for this hearing is climate change is already bringing increased temperatures, sea level rise, 100 year extreme weather events are now occurring once a decade, not once every 100 years, and it's only going to get worse. You know, I'm now talking about the, so the insular areas surrounded by sea, populations largely in low um, uh, lying areas and largely s situated in areas that are prone to both uh, hurricanes and, typho and typhoon activities. Climate change is going to continue to have an outsized impact on uh, our territories. So in all of your testimony, many of you, both written and sometimes the oral testimony, and we've already had this very extensive discussion about the need and opportunities for renewable for expanded renewable energy projects and how the Insular Area Climate Change Act can help jumpstart such projects. Uh, and the bill creates, as we know, there's the interagency task force, new grant opportunities at different agencies for renewable energy projects, as well as the study and available leasing for offshore wind opportunities, 
all bringing exciting new opportunities for cleaner power sources for the territories as, as well as greater energy independence. But I'm interested in digging a little deeper into this because some territories may be better suited for some renewable pro sources while with proper siting, all of the territories may have the opportunities for several different technologies. Mr. Ario, in your testimony, you mentioned the potential of wave energy in the Virgin Islands. Mr. Zakios, you mentioned the opportunities for solar in the Marshall Islands. And, and Ms. Gretney, you've discussed solar and wind opportunities throughout the territories. I would love for each of you to briefly go into the renewable energy potential and where this bill will help and maybe where this bill may need to have some additions. Uh, Mr. Oriel, can we start with you and Mr. Zakios and then Ms. Grechny? And if we have time from any of the other witnesses on this area, we're going to dig a little deeper into what is really the renewable potential that you see in the territories that you're here speaking about. So I'm going to start now. First, Mr. Oriel, can we start with you? Mr. Lowenthal, I believe he's having connectivity issues. Okay, who, any of the other, any of the other, you want to tell us a little bit more in depth about what are the potential for renewable on your, dig a little deeper uh, on the, on the actual uh, uh, potentials and what you see, uh, what kinds of renewable energies we're talking about. Hello, this is Austin Shelton from uh, the University of Guam. Uh, yes. and, and I'd like to, to share, um, Congressman, that uh, the potential that, that we have is to, to meet our mandates for 50% renewable energy by 2035 and 100% uh, by 2045. So our, our power authority here in Guam is confident that they are going to be able to reach the 50% with uh, existing technology and, and solar energy. Um, and as more technologies are developed over the years, uh, I think we're confident that we can get to the 100% by 2045. Uh, the, the reason that this bill, I think, is in, important for us is because it will provide a critical um, technical assistance. So we are looking forward to working with uh, the Department of Energy, uh, the, the national laboratories to exact, understand the potential for other technologies that will work. Uh, for example, in high school, I use junkyard materials to make energy from the ocean currents behind my house. So it can be done cheaply in some instances, but we need the higher level technology to shift to the greener infrastructure, which I think is possible for islands in many different ways. So now you're going to look at both at uh, the addition and the technologies around solar and then really move and look at if there are other potential sources of energy also. Correct. Anybody else want to talk about what specific energy sources you are going to move quickly to and what are the other opportunities that you see? All right, good afternoon, Congressman. This is Commissioner Oriel again. I apologize for my bandwidth issues. Um, so the, the Virgin Islands is actually uh, in the midst of a comprehensive energy strategy for the territory right now and working with a number of partners, NREL, and trying to determine what the best way forward for the territory is, which is going to be a, a diversified program. And what we do know is that with a territory population of 100,000 people, we need to make that system across the munis a municipal system, across that, because we're not going to be able to to individually support what those costs are. And so th this act and the funding that is pledged towards the planning and then the infrastructure for it allows for multiple things to be thought of uh, across that time frame. But then also because it's sustained funding, as technology evolves, we would then be able to access that funding 
and and install that infrastructure that would allow us to diversify our grid across the territories. Thank you. And I'm going to yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lontal. Let me now ask uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Gomer. He's recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate our witnesses. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. Shelton, you were talking earlier about uh, Guam's capacity and the batteries that you capacity you're developing. And by the way, um, I love your island. In fact, I love all the islands we've had representatives from. But at Guam, uh, I even loved being a single lover at Two Lovers Point out there. But uh, you got a beautiful island. But I was wondering, I'm from Texas, and what we have found is, um, and I don't want to be too elementary, but uh, in severe storms, especially prolonged severe storms, solar doesn't end up being a very reliable energy source. And I still have confidence someday, some bright mind is going to figure out how we can hold gigawatt electricity, massive amounts, and not lose much, but hold it efficiently. And I think when we, that that is the far greatest need we have. If we can hold massive gigawatt uh, electricity, as you know, we can hold DC currents and little batteries, but we're not there. But when we can, our problems will be over, I think. But in the meantime, you mentioned the batteries that you have and I'm wondering, you know, what is the capacity that you have? How much energy are you able to store and for how long? Thank you for the question, Congressman Gomer. I, I don't think I spoke about um, batteries, but I do know that the, the Guam Power Authority is uh, developing a solar farm right now that should have around 100 something megawatts storage capacity. Uh, so I, I think our, our total island uh, need for, for is, is in the megawatt range. We don't have, uh, um, I mean, two, 200 something, um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I'll, I'll find the correct numbers to, to, to submit in writing, but uh, I think we're in the 100 megawatt range for the for the storage right now with that capacity. So perhaps as islands uh, can set uh, to serve as an example in bright spot with our, our lower energy needs, that the battery storage are actually more feasible here than in, in large scale gigawatt uh, states like Texas. Yeah. Uh, uh, and how many, I I'm, haven't seen a briefing recently, how many uh, American troops do you have uh, uh, at Guam now, I was thinking some years back they were increasing those numbers. So it, it is important that we not only keep Guam powered for the good people of Guam, but also the, the wonderful host that you've been to American service members. You know about how many you've got out there on the far end of the island. No, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Congressman. Uh, I, I don't want to take a, a guess at that. I know we have uh, quite oh, a few, okay. but I will say that the Guam yeah. Power, the 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 Department of Defense is one of our Guam Power Authority's largest customers, uh, and and I think they have a good partnership uh, with the, the reliability that Guam is providing for the Department of Defense's energy needs. Okay. Well, I mean, we uh, back before nuclear energy, the Navy was the most. Uh, intensive at developing battery capacity. But then when nuclear came along and the submarines and ships shifted over to nuclear, uh, that money and that effort at research failed, but now we've got a new interest in that. I'm, I'm hoping we'll get there at some point, but we also learned in Texas through our latest storm that uh, uh, wind capacity get, can be so overwhelming that it, becomes a non-factor. So the renewables, uh, I think the key to the renewables is if we can develop a way, whether it's a battery or some type of capacitor that can can hold that energy, heck, we might even be able to, to uh, capture some lightning to power things. But in the meantime, we got to struggle along. Uh, I wanted to ask um, 
Ms. Monson. Um, you know, you're right. There's been two Category 5 devastating hurricanes. I mean, Puerto Rico has suffered before, but uh, Category 5 really is so devastating. Um, with China set to double the number of coal-powered plants that they have, and uh, India continuing to just spew so much pollution into the air, ends up coming over the U.S., I, I'm wondering what specific actions can the United States take that will stop Category 5 hurricanes? Well, th thank you for the question. I mean, this is not going to get any better from here. This is something that we have to understand. The hurricane trend of Category 4s and 5s is up. And unfortunately, right. this is going to be devastating for our islands. Um, before, we thought that we would have a Category 5 every almost 100 years. Now we are thinking perhaps 25, 20 years. And we don't know. We're three months from the hurricane season, from starting the new hurricane season, and we are in a very fragile, fragile environment because we're still recovering from Hurricane Maria. We had a earthquake oh, sequence, and also we also are under COVID. So our all our resources are compromised and are vulnerable to yeah. face another hurricane season. Well, and, and that's, that's why I was hoping that we, you, you knew of something specific we could do to uh, to help reduce the Category Five. The last thing Puerto Rico needs is another five. So anyway, uh, hopefully at some point we'll figure out what can be done to end Category Fives. But in the meantime, uh, you know our our hearts and our assistance goes to Puerto Rico. I know you're struggling, yeah. but uh, my time is expired and I appreciate your participation. Thank you. Gentleman Yields, uh, let me now ask uh, Ms. Leisure Fernandez, uh, Chair of the Indigenous Peoples Subcommittee uh, for the full committee. Uh, the, the, Ms. Fernandez is recognized. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you so, so very much uh, to our panelists, to Chairman Grijalva for this legislation, to the great questions that we're hearing that are illuminating what we must do. Um, you know, the stories of the risks of the sea level rise, the ocean warming, the you know, devastating hurricanes and cyclones, but also that the islands are rising, right? The islands are rising. I I liked um, hearing that because I think that we have much to learn and that your adaptation and response to build resiliency, to uh, get to a uh, hundred percent uh, within and 2045 is inspiring and it might provide us lessons for action throughout the US. So in this bill, among other provisions, I'm very supportive of the waiver of non-federal cost share requirements for some of the programs. You know, I've worked on FEMA disasters with tribes and other communities in New Mexico, and we know that it's our most vulnerable who suffer most uh, from disasters, but also have the fewest resources to rebuild in a green and resilient manner. So I look forward to working with my chair and colleagues to see if we can extend those exemptions to other communities and future legislation. But for the panel, um, I noticed that the bill throughout, there's language to ensure the federal agencies provide technical assistance to the communities. And as you know, in New Mexico, we have the Los Alamos National Lab and Sandia National Lab. They are so interested in working on clean energy technologies such as renewables and microgrids. You know, the chair recognized that climate crisis is a national security threat and that these labs, right, are tasked with addressing these national security threats. And so, you know, I wanted to see uh, if any of you have worked with the labs or if you see that there is an opportunity um, uh, working with these DOE labs on climate adaptation, designing energy infrastructure, you know, geothermal, uh, those new technologies uh, that Mr. Shelton uh, acknowledged we need to get to that 100% for 2045. Uh, this is a question for the panel. I don't know if Mr. Austin or if any of you want to take that up again.
Thank you, Congresswoman Fernandez. I, I can just make a quick comment that uh, we haven't had the pleasure of working with uh, the national labs based in New Mexico yet, uh, but we have worked closely in the past with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which I um, believe is in, in Colorado, if I'm not mistaken. And they helped us create our last um, energy strategy uh, for the island. And we have just applied uh, for technical assistance to create the roadmap to 100% renewable energy. So we're, we're hoping that uh, we will be considered favorably for, for that opportunity. And we look forward to learning about more technologies to achieve our 100% renewable mandate. Thank okay. you. Well, I will raise the issue with our labs and make sure that uh, they think about what are we doing in, in the territories. Uh, if anybody else wants to answer that, I'd also then maybe talk a little bit about um, the microgrids and community resilience, um, uh, especially um, if with regards to community solar and for those individuals or communities who can't afford their own rooftop solar and battery, you know, that's another issue that I think is really important. Can, um, can you, any of the panel talk about how they're implementing that in the island and whether you think you need more support? Is everything in place for you with regards to that? All right. Good afternoon, Congresswoman. This is uh, Commissioner Oriel from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, so to answer your first question, um, we we are not working with the labs in the in New Mexico area, but like Austin mentioned for Guam, the Virgin Islands is working extensively with the National um, Renewable Energy Lab based in Colorado. Um, we They are part of our um, Comprehensive Energy Strategy Technical Committee. Um, and and as I mentioned previously, we are working to diversify our grid. So microgrids are, in fact, um, one of the strategies for us. Uh, if you're familiar with the U.S. Virgin Islands, we're a system of four main islands. And, and you know, when one of the main islands, St. Thomas, will shut down, then that will have effects on our neighboring island of uh, St. John and also Water Island. And so uh, microgrids are, in fact, currently part of the strategy so that if in fact we do have a service interruption on the main island, the islands of St. John, for example, which I believe we're the furthest along on our microgrid right now, would be able to still have the energy capacity to, to power its system and power the island. Um, and, and we're looking at multiple areas to place microgrids um, rather than having everything tied back to the main plant uh, in case of interruptions that it's not disturbing the entire island all at one time. Thank you for your answer. My time has expired. I yield back. General, General Lady yields back. Let me uh, now, uh, uh, Ms. Rat Ms. Radwagon, representative, uh, the time is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member for your work and putting this hearing together. And thank you to the panel for your testimony. Uh, I also want to um, thank uh, Chairman Sablon and Ranking Member uh, Gonzalez-Colon as well uh, for the efforts on behalf of the territories. The goal of the studies and funding grants outlined in the proposal to help prepare the territories to handle the effects of climate change is noble and worthwhile. And while I do have some concerns about parts of the draft bill we're discussing today, I'm hopeful today's hearing will help us reach bipartisan solutions as we move forward. Let me begin by highlighting some of the unique challenges faced by American Samoa. Based on statistics from the University of Hawaii and briefings I've received in the past from our Sea Grant fellows, the global sea level rise averages an eighth of an inch every year in American Samoa. However, the total real delta change for American Samoa is closer to an alarming three quarters of an inch per year. So actually we've lost over seven inches in the last decade, 10% from sea rise, but 90% due to shrinking of our main island Tutuila which is essentially a mountaintop arising from the sea. We're literally sinking due to volcanic activity and seismic shifting. And it is this shrinking effect, which is the bulk of harm uh, happening much faster than the sea rise effect, 
which is somewhat unique to our principal island of Tutuila. As such, any resiliency initiatives for American Samoa should take this into consideration and prioritize buffering our seawall construction and preventing erosion. One of the other concerns faced by American Samoa is meeting our energy needs in a remote marine-based and dependent economy. Our territory knows better than anywhere else that a single hiccup in the oil supply chain can cause prices to rise or worse still, leave us completely in the dark. It makes sense not to place all of our eggs in one basket and alternate sources of energy play their part in filling those gaps. For example, the island of Ta'u in my home district is almost 100% solar powered. They're completely off the regular grid and are using some of the latest in solar panel technology. That said, not all forms of energy are created equal. We're blessed to have abundant tropical sunshine, and that is a solution that works well for us. But I have some concerns about the one size fits all approach this bill takes in places, particularly in regards to offshore wind farms. I've supported wind energy initiatives for the territories in the past that give the territorial governor's final discretion. And my office has been working with ranking member Gonzalez Colon on her wind energy legislation for a while now. This draft bill, however, departs from past drafts as it mandates that the secretary make at least one wind lease sale in each of the territories. The bill makes some efforts to consult with the territories, governors before the lease or sales. So I'd hope we can see some modification in this regard to weigh the governor's views more heavily when it comes to if, when, and where a lease or sale shall take place. My constituents have expressed concerns many times to myself, our governor, and their local village leaders about the impact windmills will have on cultural land and sea traditions, scenic views, wildlife impact, and fishing access. Our fishing has been severely restricted with National Sea Monuments expansion. We also have several endangered species of birds and bats to think about. And uh, aesthetic views from the shoreline mean much more in our island tradition. You see, we bury our dead, uh, our loved ones, right beside our homes. Sometimes, a lot of times above ground and usually with the best possible views of the sea. The creation stories of our culture revolve around Tangaloa and the creating of the Samoan Islands and others as stepping stones. The point is, our people place their loved ones on their land specifically to have these sacred views, so we must protect that tradition. I want to reiterate, I am fully supportive of keeping our alternative energy options open. Chairman Grijalva's bill comes from a good place and is a very good start, but I would hope we can accommodate our governor's authority against forced changes from Washington that will impact our island's history, culture, and way of life. American Samoa voluntarily ceded these islands in exchange for the promise of protection of just these very cultural traditions and ways of life called our Samoa. I'm hopeful the process will yield legislation that can reach an effective compromise on this front. We have 25 and 50 mile restrictions imposed on certain fishing areas, so perhaps setting distance limits so that the wind farms are not so visible from the shoreline would help, or allowing the governor a veto over projects too close to shore within specified limits would be possible. There seem to be some options here, and I'd like to work with the majority to find the best fit. Finally, lack of funding and cost matching ability often are barriers to entry to resiliency projects in American Samoa, and the chairman's bill makes great efforts addressing that. Thank you again, Chairman Grijalva, for your bill and the opportunity to comment. I know yeah. you and the ranking member and all the committee members care about the territory's needs and appreciate it. I hope you can all enjoy the natural be beauty this committee is working to protect 
on a CODEL sometime this Congress to investigate these and other issues. Thank you, and I yield back my remaining time, if there's any left, to Ranking Member Gonzalez Colon. Well, there's, I don't think there's any left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, let me, the, the, Ms. Uh, Radowagon, and, and let me tell the gentlelady that, it, that her, uh, her, her comments and her observations are, 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 uh, are important and valid and, and look forward to working with her on the points that she made. Uh, let me now ask uh, uh, Ms. Katie Porter, uh, Re Representative Chair of the o uh, Oversight and Investigations Committee uh, for her five minutes. Uh, you're recognized, Ms. Porter. Uh, Ms. Ms. Porter is recognized for five minutes. Uh, is she there? Let me, no. let me move to uh, uh, the, the gentle lady from Colorado. Uh, a valuable member of this committee, uh, Mr. Get. Floor is yours. You're recognized. Mr. Get. Not here as well, Chairman Grijalva. Okay. Let me add, uh, going down the line, Mr. Soto from. Uh, Gentleman is recognized for five minutes if he is available. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate Thank the you, opportunity. Mr. Soto. We know that climate change, the climate crisis, is an existential threat uh, to the human race. And we see low lying states like Florida be affected like so many of our insular lands, uh, whether it is through rising seas or whether it's through strengthening and extreme hurricanes, uh, as well as monsoons. And we know we have to do something about it, which is why I'm very excited about the chairman's presentation of a draft for the Insular Area Climate Change Act of 2021. Uh, it is a draft because we are seeking your input, and that is absolutely critical. Uh, as you know, the bill would help centralize and expand federal energy programs. Which programs and how we do it? We're here today to listen to that. Create multiple grant programs to invest in renewable energy and sustainable infrastructure. Taking care of the causes of climate change, fossil fuel and other pollution, and also making our infrastructure more resilient against hurricanes and other extreme weather. This bill will be a critical part of the Build Back Better infrastructure package that we will be working on over the next few months. And the bill will also ensure that our insular lands won't be left behind as we give America a well-needed upgrade. And Chairman, I wanted to thank you personally for the inclusion of the Coral Reef section, uh, which will complement our Restoring Resilient Reefs Act uh, very nicely in protecting uh, declining reefs, including the great Florida reef uh, and so many other reefs in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Turning to my family's native island of Puerto Rico, in 2019, uh, the Puerto Rican legislature passed an amazing goal, 100% renewable energy by 2050. <clears throat> Sadly, it's been about two years since we had our hearing in this committee with uh, HUD and with FEMA about the $1.9 billion HUD grant to upgrade the electrical system. We're still waiting on that. Uh, and that's critical funding uh, to help with this upgrade, to meet this challenge that the Puerto Rico legislature has set for itself. Uh, Secretary Machargo, do you know what the status of this grant is and, and why is it so important that we finally get it? Uh, uh, Mr. Congressman, could you repeat the question? Yes, as you know, 
Pastor Jorge, we passed to Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria Irma. There was one point that billion dollars for a HUD grant to upgrade the electrical grid uh, and how did with the renewable goals of the legislature. Uh, and I know the last reported you know the status of the one billion dollar HUD grant. And if you haven't gotten it yet, what can I help you? Okay, uh, the information I have uh, from the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority is that they submitted their uh, plan to FEMA and uh, they're about to get started with uh, uh, their overhaul of the electrical grid of Puerto Rico. Okay, so it looks like we uh, need to help you. Uh, Secretary of the I know of about a year ago, four percent of the total power was renewable. What, what's the percentage today? So we get a sense of what we need to do to help in this bill. Okay, uh, I think it's about uh, twenty percent, and we have to increase it according to the uh, goals of Law Thirty Three uh, uh, to increase it to fifty percent in a, a couple of years. So we are working towards that goal. Uh, the Puerto Rico Electric uh, Power Authority is uh, very aggressively pursuing renewable source of energy. And uh, the Energy Commission is uh, making sure that any further uh, expansion on the energy grid, any new kilowatt added should be uh, renewable energy. Uh, lastly, Ms. Manzoni, about the importance of community-driven renewable projects. How critical is this bill to making sure we get solar into uh, rural communities in uh, in the central part of Puerto Rico and other hurricane hard hit areas? You're on mute. And Chairman, I believe some of my time was already running by the time you called on me. Um, you may want to check with staff on that. Ms. Lanzon. Okay. Uh, it is extremely critical, Mr. Soto. As a matter of fact, I think that because of the interruption of energy, we lost so many lives because people couldn't get access to services because it was delayed for a long time. So as much as we can, we need to invest in renewable energies. It is the only way that we can make sure that hospitals, the emergency management offices, the critical essential services uh, facilities can have access to their own energy so that then they can provide the services that are needed, especially in catastrophic hurricanes or catastrophic events, because that's, that's the time where we get tested. And at that time, that's when we need to provide the services so that we don't lose lives. And in that sense, I think that we have to invest hard to switch to renewable energies and at the same time avoid disruption in water services, in, um, in healthcare, food supplies, the whole supply chain, because all of that provides for the stability and the response and recovery of our islands in case of a catastrophic event. Thank you, and my time you. Expired. Thank you, Mr. Soto. Uh, Mr. Stelber, uh, you're recognized, sir, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Grijalva. Uh, Mr. Marchargo, thank you uh, for your public service to Puerto Rico, and thank you for testifying today. Uh, Chairman Grijalva, bill calls for a massive expansion of energy technology, especially wind, as the bill requires further offshore lease, lease sales. As you may be aware, a single wind turbine requires 335 tons of steel, nearly five tons of copper, and others. One concern with this bill is that I see no Buy American requirements. In northern Minnesota, our iron miners produce the taconite that feeds 80% of this country's steel making. However, our top steel making competitor is China. Unfortunately, China's steelmaking requires a 50% percent 
higher greenhouse gas emissions footprint. For this one mill, for this one windmill, this is more than 300 tons of carbon equivalents produced if the turbine is sourced in China. If the goal is truly a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, can you commit to sourcing all of your energy components domestically? Uh, you're asking me? Mr. Chargo, yes, Mr. Chargo. Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, I'm not in charge of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. But I think your advice is well taken and uh, we should source our wind power turbines from places that are manufactured uh, with energy efficiency because we want, don't want to defeat the purpose of, of moving towards renewable energy using a, a sort of renewable energy that uh, it takes uh, uh, oil-based energy or carbon-based energy to, to manufacture. So uh, I think uh, that advice is well taken. Uh, I will convey it to the Puerto Rico Energy Commission and the uh, Air Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. So I welcome that suggestion. And I think that that's very wise to to invest in those domestically sourced materials uh, that use uh, that are produced le uh, using less uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, with our labor standards and our environmental standards. And I appreciate your comments. And I yield back, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair of the full committee, Mr. Garcia, you're recognized for five minutes. Let me go down the list of seniority, Mr. Chuy, we can't uh, hear you. Slows. Mr. Garcia, if you recognize five oh, minutes. Sorry. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Sorry about that uh, blip. Um, thank you for holding this hearing, and of course, thanks to the uh, ranking member. Uh, today, uh, we speak uh, on one of the most important issues that we're facing, and one that will impact generations to come, climate change. In one way or another, we're all impacted by climate change, uh, but for those living in the insular areas, the impact is immediate and deadly. Uh, they do not have the luxury or, pr or privilege of uh, ignoring climate change. The insular areas are a tragic reminder of why climate change cannot wait. Uh, climate action. In 2017, two major storms, Hurricane Maria and Irma, impacted Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, causing thousands of deaths and significant damage to Puerto Rico's fragile power grid especially. Over three years later, people are still reeling from the pain and the island has slowly recovered despite the federal government's slow response. The evidence is clear. Rising temperatures and uh, heavier rainfall both play a key role in intensifying hurricane strength and destruction, and it will only worsen unless we act now. As currently drafted, the Insular Area Climate Change Act of 2021 would provide the U.S. territories with long overdue access to climate change and related federal programs. Finally, but equally important to this proposal is the importance of a process that is inclusive, transparent, community-led, and community-driven. Bottom line, the people who are most impacted by climate change should be at the table. Question for Mr. Uh, Secretary Machargo Maldonado. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, do you believe, Mr. Secretary, that, um, do you agree that people who are most impacted by climate change should be included in the decision-making process? Yes. Uh, thank you, Congressman uh, Garcia. Yes, I agree that uh, the decision of the um, climate change uh, resiliency and response strategies should be uh, a product of uh, public participation and should be brought out all throughout the communities because there are many communities that are affectly, affected differently, especially those coastal communities that are seeing the, their homes uh, being eaten away by the ocean. I've been in a, in a community in Guayanilla, El Paro, that has been literally sinking 
and the people are losing their house. So those people ha have the more severe impact to uh, be heard, from, heard, heard and uh, yeah. input. So I agree with you, Congressman Garcia. Thank you, sir. And are you aware of the harmful impact uh, that the construction of a proposed development, the uh, Contel Adventure in Santa Isabel, would have on the community, environment, and endangered species, including cutting off the uh, residents from the city from access to the beach? Oh, well, uh, according to the law of uh, the Command of Puerto Rico, the everybody should have access to the beach. That would be illegal to cut people from access to the beach. Uh, I will take note of uh, that case that you mentioned. I, I will look into it to see if they have all, all the permits and I uh, will evaluate uh, any negative impact that that project will have in, uh, on the surrounding communities. Thank you, uh, Secretary. Um, also, I want to know if the communities near uh, Bahia Jauca were informed in advance of this development and why uh, were, there, were there public forums or not? I've heard that there weren't to address the concerns. Uh, that would be appreciated. The communities okay. near Bahia Jauca uh, uh, were some of the hardest hit by Hurricane Maria and are still struggling more than three years later. A project of this size with potential negative environmental impact must have public input uh, and consideration. So, Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to enter a letter on behalf of Palvemos Auca into, into the record. Palvemos Auca uh, is a movement by local organizers to ensure that the ecological and bio, uh, bio diverse treasures of Bahia Auca are preserved. Most importantly, uh, community input must always be prioritized in this process so that people who are most impacted by such development have their voices heard. Thank you, and uh, if there's unanimous consent, I yield back. Without objection, uh, so ordered, and uh, Mr. Secretary, let me let me associate myself with uh, Mr. Garcia's question and comments uh, regarding this development, and uh, any information that is forthcoming will be disseminated to the committee. It's a great deal of interest on the part of many of us as to uh, that particular development and uh, its potential impacts. Uh, and so uh, looking forward to it, and thank you very much for your willingness to provide that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will look into the case and provide the committee, committee with information regarding the case and uh, the concern of the public participation. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Let me recognize Tiffany. Sir, you're recognized for five minutes. Yes. yes. Representative Tiffany, you're recognized for five minutes. If not, uh, Representative Carl, sir, you're recognized for five. Representative uh, Rosendale, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking you're welcome. Member. Thank sir, you, you recognized. Um, sir, you recognized. Rosendale? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Chair Grijalva and Ranking Member Westerman, and, and thank you to the uh, entire panel for joining us. As an avid outdoorsman who lives in a rural community adjacent to Montana's largest state park, Makoshika, and two of the nation's gems, Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park, I know how special the environment is to our way of life in Montana and to the balance of the United States and the territories. I believe that we have an obligation to balance environmental protections with responsible energy production, and the two are not mutually exclusive. It is of grave concern to me when the government unfairly picks energy winners and losers in order to placate the environmental green lobby. 
modern American energy development goes to great lengths to minimize their environmental footprint by operating under the strictest regulatory standards and restoring disturbed areas to better than pre-developed condition. Traditional fuel sources continue to be the most reliable source of energy for the electric grid. They can be stored on site, are dispatchable, and operate 24-7, 365 days a year. While I believe in an all of the above energy approach, this proposal completely ignores that science and continues to push the left's Green New Deal initiative, which dramatically drives up energy costs for those who can least afford it. So, Secretary Maldonado, Maldonado, excuse me, thank you for being here today. Nearly three-fourths of the energy used in Puerto Rico comes from petroleum products, all of which are important. Currently, just 2.5% of Puerto Rico's electricity is generated by renewable. We have seen the devastating impacts hurricanes have had in Puerto Rico and the need for a reliable energy grid. How does Puerto Rico plan to implement grid reliability if mandated to transition to 100% renewable energy? And what measurable impact will this have on our climate? Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Congressman for the question uh one of the ways that uh, puerto rico should uh, recover uh, and rebuild its electric grid is through the use of uh, microgrids uh, to make sure that critical infrastructure like hospitals and government buildings should uh, have uh, energy sources also uh, uh, due to the production cost of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, moving towards renewable energy as representing a saving in the cost per kilowatt. But uh, and uh, uh, regarding the effect on uh, on Puerto Rico's contribution to the global output, I, I don't think it, it will be that great. But every little bit helps. <laughs> That's an awful lot to pay for a little bit of help, Mr. Maldonado. Do we have any kind of, uh, we still have some time here, do we have any kind of cost estimate on, on what that investment would take? Mr. Rosendale, will, do you, will you yield? Yes, I will. Thank you, Mr. Rosendale. Uh, the Secretary is uh, from Natural Resources uh, Department, so he's not in charge of the energy uh, of the island. So we do have uh, Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, which is the company, the government-owned company managing all energy, and then you got the Energy Commission. Uh, as And I agree with you 200%. Uh, we need to look forward for having energy uh, solutions on the island uh, that can be reliable, that can be constant, that can uh, meet the demand of the industry as well. Uh, and being an island, that means that right now we are, we're burning oil um, and we, we, we need LNG, we need a lot of other uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, uh, and, and I know that island approval law uh, to have 100% renewables by 2050, but right now it's just 2% uh, what we got. Um, so I think one of the biggest issues is it's bringing the Energy Commission of Puerto Rico and discuss that same question you brought to the committee. Uh, how how much is going to cost? Uh, how soon that is going to be implemented? Because you, you're just putting, uh, you, you're hitting the target here. And and I think the, the perfect people to answer those questions should be the Energy Commission of the island and, and the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. And with that, I yield to you. Thank you. Yield back. I, yield, I yield back to you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. C new member to the committee. Welcome, new member to the committee, Mr. Cohen. You're recognized for five minutes if you're available. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am here. I've enjoyed the uh, the meeting. This is my first uh, committee meeting on natural resource freshman, uh, a rookie. I appreciate you're not requiring me to wear a beanie and signify that, but uh, I would do that because it's an honor to be on this committee. 
And climate change is one of the major reasons why I wanted to be on this committee and protection of our of our of waters uh, and oceans. And of course, that would include the insular areas. So I thank you for the committee meeting. Uh, I had a great opportunity to visit uh, Puerto Rico February a year ago with uh, Chairman DeFazio on a CODEL and uh, the, the ranking member was, uh, I think, joining us in the Virgin Islands. Uh, first time I've been to either of uh, the, those parts of the United States and I learned a lot and enjoyed the uh, experience and uh, learned about the, the hurricanes and the devastation on those two islands. Uh, we need to be concerned about the effects the climate will have on those islands and of all the islands in the United States. Uh, and so this is an important meeting and, and I'm just learning and uh, we'll follow it along and, and try to learn more about the, the, what we can do to, to protect these areas, which we need to do. They're valuable. And I just wonder, is the gentleman still on from the Virgin Islands? Yes, Congressman. Yes, I am. Have you have you all constructed a a, a, a statue of Delegate Plaskett yet? She, you know, she's <laughs> <a> hero. <laughs> I'm sure it's in the works. <laughs> I, I, one time I thought he, he was the greatest guy from the Virgin Islands, but uh, Stacy Plaskett has surpassed him. She's phenomenal, and uh, and Delegate Gonzalez treated us wonderfully in Puerto Rico, and I thank her for that. It was a great trip and a learning experience. She, she taught me something about Roberto Clemente, but she didn't tell me that uh, uh, Francisco Lindor was also from Puerto Rico, and, and he's a good guy, too. But I'll yield back and look forward to learning from the chairman and the other members and uh, take my position as a freshman. I yield back my time. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Mr. Cohen. Am I muted? I appreciate it. Uh, let me now ask uh, Mr. Moore, uh, you were recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you all for being here today. I, I do appreciate the time you've taken to share with us some of the challenges you face. I, I try to make every issue that comes up a bit personal. Um, and this, this, this is an, another area after the, the hurricane or after the devastation in Puerto Rico, a very, very close friend of mine is is married to a gal whose sister lives in Puerto Rico. He organized a trip, he raised money, he went down there personally. Um, being able to contribute in, in a small way to that is another, it, it's a way that brings our world together. Um, the the areas in the, the, that are involved in this, they, they mean a great deal to, um, to America, to the inclusive nature of territories, states, whatever you wanna, do it. This is an inclusive matter, right? And uh, with respect to two big areas with with military and tourism, um, I, I hope that's able to communicate. And I hope that 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 you're able to understand that this entire committee cares and understands that greatly. Um, some of the comments previously, you know, just about the importance of, of military. I also serve on House Armed Services. And so I hope to be able to bring this topic, you know, to um, to, to, to that committee as well, given the specific nature of Guam. Um, I, I do have concerns uh, with the discussion draft, the discussion draft of the insular area climate change. We've made incredible strides in recent years towards reducing our emissions, improving the efficiency of our energy infrastructure and making breakthroughs in, in cleaner technologies. And, and, and I wanna always be a force for, for market-based solutions um, and, and, and not forcing or overly mandating these types of things, but creating the right incentive program, creating the right data to be able to continue to move us in the right direction. Um, I, I sincerely believe that the market is doing a good job at this and, and we're witnessing a shift towards cleaner technologies. Um, so I don't want, I, I just wanna be able to be a voice in making sure that this debate on this topic isn't shaped by sensationalism. We can't focus only on one industry or one interest group with respect to this, this topic. And, uh, and, I, and I hope that we can create a really good dialogue going on with, with all of my colleagues on this committee and those of you that are willing to show up. Um, a few, I have a few questions in mind and uh, I'm gonna, and one was just, I believe brought up, uh, but feel free to touch on it as I, as I toss this over to some of the, the experts here or the witnesses, um, just specifically in plain speak, how, 
how can we move towards um, replacing petroleum as with what can we replace it with for a reliable source on on on, on the island specifically for Puerto Rico, given that 75% of Puerto Rico's energy needs are met. But the other question that I'll pose, um, and I welcome to any comments as this last couple of minutes remains, um, in the, I believe strong believer in the importance of locally inspired, local led and locally executed projects. Any additional experiences that you all have had um, that will contribute to that, uh, would you like to share with us at, at this time I, I think that we can find real solutions in that local lead. So either of those two questions, I'll, I'll yield to anybody that, that would like to, to jump in on that. I don't want to specifically make, make um, direct my comments towards anybody, but um, I'll, I'll yield though. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, Mr. So in particular, Mr. Shelton would be, you know, any other locally inspired that you'd like to share. Thank you, Congressman Moore. Uh, we have, I think, for for locally inspired um, energy generation, that's that's a little difficult. I mean, there there are some instances, like I mentioned earlier, that you, we can generate some of our own electricity with uh, backyard contraptions, but it's not enough to to move to 100% renewable energy that that we would like to do. Um, I think one of the, the things that could lead to more affordability, um, you know, I, I, there are some studies, I'm not an economics expert, but there are heavy subsidies for fossil fuels still and fewer subsidies for renewable energy. So if that, if that can help with affordability, uh, that would be great. And also that um, uh, we also need to think about the long-term costs for islands. Maybe it's more affordable to the ratepayer for using fossil fuels today, but we're going to have a lot of infrastructure costs to literally, like, uh, literally raise the islands. You know, not in my metaphorical sense that I was using earlier, but we will have to build the infrastructure to avoid the rising seas if that's the the way that we continue to um, uh, to view the affordability in the short term versus the long term. Thank you, Congressman. Thanks. And it looks like our time could it could be up, so I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Gentleman yields. Uh, uh, Representative Talib, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, while my district may be far from Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands, we have more in common than one might think. My district is full of frontline communities directly exposed to the climate crisis from what we call the zip code 48217, where the concentration of corporate polluters is literally killing my neighbors, to a city of Dearborn Heights where I share, uh, that I share with Congresswoman Dingle, where increased flooding in the e Course Creek is threatening people's lives. The sooner we realize that our fates are all connected and that nobody will be spared by our climate inaction, the sooner we can pass laws like the Insular Area Climate Change Act that takes real steps to protect our most vulnerable communities. And it should not be controversial. Throughout the COVID pandemic, I have been contacted by my mayors in my district who face barriers to using federal relief funds because of cost sharing requirements they couldn't meet. And I know the pain these requirements can be imposed. So I'm glad to see match requirements waived in this bill. Mr. Oriel, how would waiving the non-federal cost sharing requirements truly benefit the people of the Virgin Islands and allow you all to better fight climate change and its effects? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman Tlaib. Um, well, even as, as we speak right now, the Virgin Islands, um, through the administration of the uh, HUD CDBG DR grant, I mean, they the and the um, hazard mitigation funding for uh, recovery right now from hurricanes or in Irma and Maria require us to have some cost share. Um, I believe it's 10% at this time. And so um, it, it is a, when you're talking about a billion dollars in, in relief aid, but needing to come up with that 10% match requirement, um, that, that is a huge obstacle for uh, a territory with 100,000 residents who are suffering from a pandemic whose primary source of income is tourism and everything has been shut down for over 15 or 12 months now. And so, um, and, and as, as this will continue, um, you know, those are the types of things that the, the administration has to grapple with is how. And yes. so cost share relief, even down to the smaller grants, where 
it allows us to be able to directly implement some of the uh, strategies that we list with our federal partners and, and get those out onto the ground. Um, so it, it is a huge, huge relief from our very small $200,000 grant up to our billion dollar I, assistance. Awards. I couldn't agree more. I, you know, in my district, uh, municipalities have been ravaged by debt. I don't know if you know, the city of Detroit recently went through the biggest municipal bankruptcy in American history. And I saw, I saw the impact on my residents and the city of Inkster in my district lost its entire school district because of outstanding debt. So I really do appreciate the leadership of our chairman. So Mr. Bel, uh, Meldonano, um, one of the president, uh, president's campaign promises was to forgive disaster relief loans to Puerto Rico uh, in the municipalities there so they can recover faster. How would this proposal, which is also included in the bill at section 601, help Puerto Rico? And Mr. Chair, I, I couldn't see that Mr. Meldonado was still with us. If not, I can proceed. Yeah, I, I am here. Uh, He's here. Uh, Madam, could you repeat the question? Um, I was talking about, uh, you know, one of the things that our current president uh, had promised was to forgive disaster relief loans to Puerto Rico. And I know we talked a little bit about that in the municipality so they can recover faster. And so, you know, how does this proposal, which also includes uh, includes in the bill is a, the section 601, how does that really help the Puerto Rican people? Well, uh, we have a situation uh, with the cost chair, uh, of the relief programs that are putting some small municipalities to strain because uh, they don't have a, a FEMA works with the reimbursements and they don't have a, the money to start the projects and we in the local government have been developing like a great line, uh, line of credit so the municipalities can start the project. That provision of the of the bill will greatly help because uh, we cannot because time is limited. Would you say it, it it truly paralyzes you all from continuing the services and support for the people? Am I yeah, correct? Yeah, yes, it, yeah. yes, it does. It's the same thing in the city of Detroit. I'm really just you know and bear with me, Chairman. I really want to show just how connected it is that we can't allow communities to continue to fail like this. Uh, and these are, you know, we're still seeing the impact of allowing Detroit to go bankrupt and we can't continue to allow communities across the world to to, to, to be able to face, especially Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, which is really, um, it's really up to us, the United States to protect them. So thank you all so much, I yield. Thank you very much. Uh representative and thank you for i think it's important to make that connection I'm, I'm i'm glad that 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 you brought that up because uh uh sometimes we deal with the issue of climate change and isolation of everything else and we shouldn't and i, I appreciate that uh there are no further uh members that are seeking uh, uh seeking to be recognized for questions uh i do want to uh thank the witnesses for their testimony and as i said initially before i adjourned that uh, the importance of uh this is we wanted to bring this as a draft so that we have uh the opportunity uh to, to receive input and thank you very much to the witnesses for that uh, and also from our colleagues uh the the importance of this uh piece of legislation can't be underestimated but but also the uh the need to uh, to take some action cannot be ignored either. Uh, the the move toward dealing, coming up with some compromise and some bipartisan agreements if uh, that uh, will be necessary going forward is important. Uh, but the need to take action is also important, and uh, that process will not go on uh, in perpetuity. Uh, and we'll, we'll our staff will proceed to try to work with you, and I will certainly create outreach with um, uh, Ms. Colon and uh, Ms. Radwagon to see uh, those areas in which uh, they brought up some issues that we can deal with. Uh, thank you very much. I, before, uh, before I close and before we close on, on the witnesses, there was, a, there was a report that was issued by the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, Puerto Rico could be considered a canary in the coal mine, it said, for climate change because it has been feeling the consequences of a warming world for some time. 
In fact, the same can be said for all of the islands that we're dealing with today. Let me ask Ms. Uh, Monsoon, uh, do you agree with that, this assessment? And are these specific example, and uh, do you agree with the assessment that the uh, Defense Fund came up with uh, regarding the uh, canary in the coal mine? If she's still available. Ms. Monsoon? She needs to unmute. Okay. Sorry about that. Is that you got cut off and I couldn't follow the statement. No. Could you repeat it, please? There, there, there was a the you know report issued by the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, when it's speaking of Puerto Rico, it said uh, Puerto Rico could be considered as a canary in the coal mine for climate change because it's been feeling the consequences of a warming world for some time already. In fact, the same could be said for all the islands that we've been talking about today relative to this legislation. So my question real simply to you was, do you agree with that as assessment? And, uh, and uh, just for yes. you to comment on that. Yes. Yes. Yes, Mr. Grijalva, I, I agree. Um, no one can be surprised that our island has been subject to the most catastrophic impact of climate change. We are suffering from the coastal erosion. We're suffering from catastrophic hurricanes, one after the other. Even the health impact that we've had because of these things and also because of the economic development that is stalling in many areas of the island that means that we definitely if we can survive if we can do it right especially with all the funding that we are receiving in puerto rico to build better and safer definitely we can be the example for the americas and for the entire planet on how to do it right. I totally agree that we have the advantage of doing something better now than we've ever had. This is a historic moment for Puerto Rico, a historic Thank moment. Thank you. I agree. Thank you very much. Mr. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. okay.